Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube. I'm John Furrier, the host of the Cube in Palo Alto, California. Also, it's Silicon Angle News. We've got two great guests here. Now, talk about AI, the impact of the future of the internet, the applications, the people. Amar Awadallah, the founder and CEO, and Ed Albanese, the COO of Victara, a new startup that emerged out of the original Cloudera, I would say, because Amar's known famous for the Cloudera founding, which was really the beginning of the big data movement. And now as AI goes mainstream, there's so much to talk about, so much to go on, and plus the new company is one of the now, what I call the wave, this next big wave, I call it the fifth wave in the industry. You know, you had PCs, you had the internet, you had mobile. This generative AI thing is real, and it's, you're starting to see startups come out in droves. Amar obviously has the found, founder of Cloudera, Big Data, and uh, Victara, and Ed, you guys have a new company. Welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. So great to see you. Now, the story is the Cube started in the Cloudera office, thanks to you and, mm -hmm. and your, your friendly entrepreneurship uh, views that you have. We got to know each other over the years, but Cloudera had Hadoop, which was the beginning of what I call the big data wave, which then became what we now call data lakes, data oceans, mm -hmm. and data infrastructure that's developed from that. It's almost interesting to look back 12 plus years and see that what AI is doing now, right now, is opening up the eyes to the mainstream. And the application is almost mind blowing. You know, Satya Nadella called it the mosaic moment. Didn't say Netscape, <laughs> didn't say guild Netscape, but the mosaic moment. Mm -hmm. You're seeing companies and startups you know, kind of the alpha geeks running here because this is the new frontier and this real meat on the bone in terms of like things to do. Mm -hmm. Why, why is this happening now? What's the, what is the confluence of the forces happening that making this happen? Yeah, I mean, if you go back uh, to the Cloudera days with big data and so on, that was more about data processing. Like how can we process data? So we can extract numbers from it and do reporting and maybe take some actions like this is a fraud transaction or this is not. And uh, in the meanwhile, many of the researchers working in the neural network and deep neural network space were trying to focus on data understanding. Like how can I understand the data and learn from it so I can take actual actions based on the data directly, just like a human does. And uh, we were only good at doing that at the level of somebody who was five years old or seven years old, all the way until about 2013. And starting in 2013, which is only 10 years ago, a number of key innovations started taking place and each one added on, it was no major innovation that just took place, it was a couple of really incremental ones, but they added on top of each other in a very um, uh, exponentially uh, additive way that led to, by the end of 2019, we now have models, deep neural network models, that can read and understand human text just like we do, right? And they can reason about it and argue with you and explain it to you. And I think that's what is unlocking this whole new uh, wave of innovation that we're seeing right now. So data understanding yeah. would be the essence of it. So it's not a big bang kind of theory. It's been evolving over time. And I think that the tipping point has been the, the advancements and other things. I mean, look at cloud computing and look how fast it just crept up on AWS. I mean, AWS, you were back five years ago, I was talking at Swami yesterday and there's big news about AI expanding the hugging face relationship with AWS. And, just three, five years ago, there wasn't a lot of training models out there. So, but as compute comes out and you got more horsepower, these large language models, these foundational models, they're flexible. They're not monolithic silos. They're interacting. There's a whole new, almost fusion of data happening. Do you see that? I mean, is that part of this? What's of course, of course. I mean, this, this wave is building on all the previous waves. Like the, the, we wouldn't be at this point if we did not have uh, hardware that can scale in a very efficient way. We wouldn't be at this point, we didn't have data that we're collecting about everything we do that we're able to process in this way. So this, this movement, this motion, this phase we're in absolutely builds on the shoulders of all the previous uh, phases. For some of the observers from the outside, when they see ChatGPT for the first time, for them it's like, oh my God, this is an inflect, this just happened overnight. Like it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> uh, GPT itself, like GPT-3, which is what ChatGPT is, uh, is based on, was released a year ahead of ChatGPT. And many of us were seeing the power it can provide and what it can uh, can do. I don't know if Ed agrees with, with that. Yeah, Ed, what's your I mean, I do, although I would acknowledge that the possibilities now ha have, ha because of what we've hit from a maturity standpoint, have yeah. just opened up in an incredible way that just wasn't tenable even three years ago. And that's what makes it, <clears throat> it's true that it developed incrementally yeah. in the same way that you know, the possibilities of a mobile handheld device, you know, in 2006 were there, but when the iPhone came out, 
uh, the possibilities just exploded. Yeah. I mean, I and think that's the moment we're in. Well, I think I, we have had, had many conversations over the past couple months around this area with ChatGPT. Uh, John Markoff uh, told me the other day that he calls it the $5 toy. Um, because it's not that big of a deal in context to what AI is doing behind the scenes and all the work that's done on ethics that's happened over the years, but it has woken up the mainstream, so everyone immediately jumps to ethics. Does it work? It's not factual. When we're, and everyone who's inside the industry, this is amazing, because you have two schools of thought there. The one's like, people that, name, this is not the beginning of next gen. This is now we're here. This, mm -hmm. ain't, this ain't your grandfather's chatbot. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's with great. NLP, it's got reasoning, it's yeah. got other things, so. They yeah, I'm in that camp for sure. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> everyone who knows what's going on is in that yeah. camp. And as the naysayers start to, to get through this, they go, wow, it's not just plagiarizing homework, it's, it's helping me be better. Like, mm -hmm. it could rewrite my memo, bring the lead to the top. It's, so there's a, the format of the user interface is interesting, but it's still data-driven app. Absolutely. So where does it go for me? Because I, I, I'm not even calling this the first inning. This is like pregame, in my opinion. Where do you guys see this going in terms of scratching the surface to what happens next? I mean, <clears throat> I'll start with, I, I just don't see how an application is going to look the same in the next three years. What, who's going to want to input data manually in a form field? Who is going to want or expect to have to put in some text in a search box and then read through 15 different possibilities and try to figure out which one of them actually most closely resembles the question they asked. You know, I, I don't see that happening. Who's going to start with an absolute blank sheet of paper and expect no help? That is not how an application will work in the next three years. Yeah. And it's going to fundamentally change how people interact and spend time with any, any opening any element on their mobile phone or on their computer to get something done. Yes, I agree with that. Like every single application over the next five years will be rewritten uh, to be to fit within this model. Uh, so imagine an HR application. I don't want to name companies, but imagine an HR application and you go into application and you're clicking on buttons because you want to take two weeks of vacation. And menus and clicking here and there, reasons and managers versus just telling the system, I'm taking two weeks vacation going to Las Vegas, book it, done. Yeah. And the system just does it for you. If it, if it doesn't, if you weren't complete in your input and in your description for what you want, then the system asks you back. Did you mean this? Did you mean that? Were you trying to also do this as well? Yeah. What was the reason? And that will fit it for you and just do it for you. So I think the user interface that we have with apps is going to change to be very similar to the user interface yeah. that we have with each other. Yeah. And that's why all these apps will need to evolve. Well, we, I know we don't have a lot of time because you guys are very busy, but I want to definitely have multiple segments with you guys on this topic because there's so much to talk about. There's a lot of parallels going on here. I was talking again with Swami, who uh, runs all the AI database at AWS, and, mm -hmm. and I asked him, I go, this feels a lot like the original AWS. You don't have to provision a data center. A lot of this hard, lift, heavy lifting on the back end is these large language models, all these foundational models. So the bottleneck in the past was the energy and cost to actually do it. Now you're seeing it being stood up faster. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely going to be a tsunami of apps. I mm -hmm. would see that clearly. What is it? We don't know yet. But also people who are going to leverage the fact that I can get started building value. So the, I see a startup boom coming and I see an application tsunami re of refactoring. Yes. Mm -hmm. Things. Yes. So the replatforming is already kind of happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. Open AI, ChatGPT, whatever. So that's going to be a developer environment. I mean, if Amazon turns this into an API or a Microsoft, what you guys are I doing. Mean, we're turning it into the API as well. That's hey. part of what we're doing as well, yes. This is but why I want yeah. to, this is why this is exciting. Yeah. Amr, you've lived the big data dream and, and, and uh, we used to talk, if you didn't have a big data problem, if you weren't full of data, you weren't really getting it. Mm -hmm. Now people have all the data. Mm -hmm and they got to stand yeah, this yeah, up. Yeah, so the, the analogy is again, the mobile, I like the mobile movement and using mobile as an analogy. Most companies were not building for a mobile environment, right? They were just building for the web and legacy way of doing apps. And as soon as the user expectations shifted, that my expectation now, I need to be able to do my job on this small screen on the mobile device with a touch screen. Everybody had to invest in re-architecting and re-implementing every single app yeah. to fit within that model and that mode of interaction. And we're seeing the exact same thing happen now. And one of the core things we're focused on at, uh, at Victara is how to simplify that for organizations. Because a lot of them are overwhelmed by large language models and ML. They and don't AI have the staff. And, yeah, 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 and understaffed, they don't have the skills. But they cetera, got developers, they got DevOps. Yes. Right, so yes. they have the DevSecOps exactly. going on. Yes. All right, so, so, so our goal is to simplify it enough for them that they can start leveraging this technology effectively within their applications. Ed, you're the COO of the company. Obviously, the startup, you guys are growing, you got great, great back and good team. As you also done a lot of business development and technical business development in this area. Mm -hmm. If you look at the landscape right now, and I agree, the apps are, are coming. 
every company I talk to that has that chat GPT, of, 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 you know, epiphany. <laughs> oh my God, look how cool this is, like magic. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, it's calm, settle down. But everyone I talk to is ta using it in a very horizontal way. I talked to a, 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 a very senior person, very tech alpha, alpha geek, very senior person in the industry technically. They're using it for log data. They're mm -hmm. using it for configuration of routers and other areas are using it for, every vertical has a use case. Mm -hmm. So this is <coughs> horizontally mm -hmm. scalable from a use case standpoint. When you, when you hear horizontally scalable, first thing I chose in my mind is cloud, mm -hmm. right? So cloud and scalability that way. And the data is very specialized. So now you have this vertically specialization, horizontally scalable, everyone will be refactoring. What do you see and how do you, what are you seeing from customers that you talk to and prospects? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, put yourself in the shoes of an application developer who is actually trying to make their application a bit more like magic and to have that, that, that soon to be honestly expected experience. They've got to think about things like performance and how efficiently that they can actually execute uh, a, a query or a question. They've got to think about cost. Um, generative isn't cheap, like the inference of it. And so you've got to be thoughtful about how, you, how and when you take advantage of it. You can't use it as a, you know, everything looks like a nail and I've got a hammer and I'm going to hit everything with it because that will be wasteful. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> developers also need to think about how they're going to take advantage of but not lose their own data. So there has to be some controls around what they feed into the large language model, if anything, like should they fine tune a large language model with their own data? Can they keep it logically separated but still take advantage of the powers of a large language model? And they've also got to take advantage, you know, take, be aware of the fact that when data is generated, that it is a different class of data. It might not fully be their own yeah. and it may not even be fully verified. And so when the logical cycle starts of someone making a, a request, the relationship between that request and the output those things have to be stored safely, logically, identified as such, and yeah. you know, and taken advantage of in an ongoing fashion. So these are these are mega problems, each one of them independently. That uh, you know, you can think of it as middleware companies yeah. um, need to take advantage of and think about to help uh, the next wave of application development be logical, sensible, effective. It's not just calling some raw API yeah. on the cloud like OpenAI and then just you know, you get your answer and you're done because that, that is a very brute force approach. Well, also I will point, first of all, I, I agree with your statement about the apps experience that's going to be expected, mm -hmm. form filling, great point. The, the interesting about chat. So, sorry, it's not just form filling, filling it's any action. It's any, any action yes. you would like to take. Yeah. Instead of taking it by clicking and dragging and dropping and doing it in a menu or on a, on a touch screen, you just say it and, it's, yeah. and it happens yeah. perfectly. Yeah, it's different, it's different interface. And that's why I love that UI, UX experiences. That's the people falling out of their chair moment with ChatGPT. Right. But a lot of the things with ChatGPT, if you, if you feed it right, it works great. If you feed it wrong and yeah. it goes off the rails, it goes off the rails <laughs> yes. big. Yes, yes. Right. The, the, yes. the, the Bing uh, catastrophes. Yeah. And that's, that's an example of garbage in, garbage out. Classic old school kind of comp sci mm -hmm. phrase that we all use. Yep. Yes. This is about data in injection, right? It reminds it me of the old SQL days. If you had to, if you can sling some SQL, you were a magician, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. pretty much there. So, yes. you got to feed the AI. You do. Some people call this the early word to describe this is prompt engineering. You know, old school, you know, search or you know, engagement with data would be I'm gonna, I have a question or I have a query. New school is I have I have to issue it a prompt because I'm trying to get uh, you know an action or a reaction from the system, and the active engineering that, there are, there are a lot of different ways you could do it, all the way from you know raw, just I'm going to send you whatever I'm thinking yeah. and you get the unintended outcomes, to more constrained, where I'm going to just use my own data and, and I'm going to constrain the initial inputs, the data I already know that's first party and I trust, yeah. um, to you know hyper constrained, where the application is actually it, it's looking for certain <laughs> elements yeah. to, to, to respond to. It's interesting, Amar, this is, this is why I love this, because one, we are in the media business, we're recording this video now, we'll stream it, <laughs> but we got all your linguistics, we're talking. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is data. Yeah. So the data quality becomes now the new intellectual property because the, if you have that prompt source data, it makes data or content, in our case, the original content, intellectual property. Absolutely. Because that's the value. And that's where you see ChatGPT mm -hmm. fall down is because they're trying to scroll the web and people think it's search. It's not necessarily search, it's it's giving you something that you wanted. It's, it is a lot of that, uh, I remember in Cloudera you said, ask the right questions. Remember mm -hmm. that phrase, you guys mm -hmm. had that slogan? Mm -hmm. And that's prompt engineering. So that's exactly, that's uh, the reinvention of ask the right question is prompt engineering. Is if you don't give these models the question in the right way, 
and very few people know how to frame it in the right way with the right context, then you will get garbage outs, right? That is the garbage in, garbage out. But if you specify the question correctly, and you provide with it the metadata that constrain what that question is going uh, to be uh, acted upon or answered upon, then you'll get much better answers. And that's exactly what we solved at uh, Victara. Okay, so before we get into the last couple of minutes we have left, I want to make sure we get a plug in for the, the opportunity in the profile of Victara, your new mm -hmm. company. Um, can you guys both uh, share with me a bit, uh, what you think the current situation is? So for the folks who are, who are now having those moments of, ah, AI is bullshit, or, ah, it's, it's not real, it's a lot of stuff. So, oh my God, this is magic to, okay, this is the future. Yes. What would you say to that person if you're at a cocktail party or in the elevator, you say, calm down, this is the first inning. How do you explain the dynamics going on right now to someone who's either in the industry or, but not in, not in the ropes? How would you explain like the, the, what this wave's about? How would you describe it? And how would you pre have prepare them for how to change their life around this? Yeah, so we, I, I'll go first and then I'll let Ed go. Efficiency. Efficiency is the, the description. So we, we figured out a way to be a lot more efficient. We are a way where you can write a lot more emails, create way more content, create way, way more presentations. Developers can develop uh, 10 times faster than they normally w w would. And that is very similar to what happened during the Industrial Revolution. I always like to look at examples from the past to read uh, what will happen now and what will happen in the future. So during the Industrial Revolution, it was about efficiency with our hands, right? So I had to make a piece of cloth like this, a uh, piece of cloth for this shirt I'm wearing. Our ancestors, they had to spend uh, a month uh, taking the cotton, making it into threads, taking the threads, making them into pieces of cloth, and then cutting it. And now a machine makes it just like that, right? And the ancestors now turned from the people that do the thing to manage the machines that do the thing. And I, I, I think the same thing was going to happen now, is our efficiency will be multiplied extremely as human beings, and we'll be able to do a lot more. And many of us will be able to do things they couldn't do before. Uh, so another great example I always like to use is the example of Google Maps and GPS. Very few of us knew how to drive a car from one location to another and read a map and, and get there correctly. Uh, but once that efficiency of an AI, by the way, and the behind these things is very, very complex AI, that figures out how to do that for us, all of us now became amazing navigators <laughs> that can go from any point to yeah. any point. So that's kind of how I look at the future. Yeah. And, how and that's a great it. real example of impact. Ed, your take on uh, how you would talk to a friend or colleague or anyone who asks, like, how do I make sense of the current situation? Is it real? What do I, how does it, what's in it for me and what do I do? I mean, every company is rethinking their business right now uh, around this. What, what would you say to them? You know, I usually like to, to show rather than, uh, than describe. And so, you know, the other day I just got access, I've been using an application for a long time called Notion and it's super popular. There's like 30 or 40 million users. And the new version of Notion came out, which has AI embedded within it. And it, it's AI that allows you primarily to create. So if you could break the world down of AI into find and create for a minute, just kind of logically separate those two things, find is certainly going to be massively impacted in our experiences as consumers on you know, Google and Bing. And, and I can't believe I just said the word Bing in the same <laughs> sentence as Google, but that's what's happening now because of a good example of change. Yes. But also um, inside the business, but on the create side, you know, Notion is a, a wiki product where you, you know, you try to, you know, note down things that you are thinking about or that you want to share and memorialize. But sometimes you do need help to get it down fast. And just in the first day of using this new product, like my experience has really fundamentally changed. And I think that anybody who would, you know, anybody say, for example, that um, is using an existing app, I would show them open up the app. Now imagine the possibility of getting a starting point right off the bat in five seconds of, instead of having a whole cloth draft this thing, imagine getting a starting point to then you can modify and edit or just dispose of and retry again. And that's the, that's the potential for me. I, I can't imagine a scenario where in a few years from now, I'm going to be satisfied if I don't have a little bit of help in the same way that I don't, I I don't manually spell check yeah. every email that I send. I automatically yeah. spell check it. I love when I'm getting type ahead support <laughs> inside of Google <laughs> or anything. Doesn't mean I always take yeah. it or it's texting. Efficiency. That's efficiency yeah. too. Exactly. The keyword is I mean, yes. the, I mean uh, the cloud was about developers getting mm -hmm. stuff up quick. Exactly. All that heavy lifting is there for you, so you don't have to do it. Right. And you get to the value faster. Exactly. I mean, if history told us one thing, it's you have to always embrace efficiency. And if you don't, fast enough, <laughs> you will fall behind. Again, again, lo again, looking at the Industrial Revolution, the companies that uh, embraced the Industrial Revolution, they became the leaders in the world, and the ones who did not, they all died. Well, they the AI died. thing that we got to watch out for is watching how it goes off the rails. If it doesn't have the right prompt engineering yes. or data, yes. 
architecture, yeah. infrastructure, yes. it's a big part. So this yes. comes back down to your startup. Um, real quick, I know we got a couple minutes left. Talk about the company, the motivation, and we'll do a deeper dive on, on the company, but what's the motivation? What's the, what are you targeting for the market? Business model, the tech, let's go. Actually, I would like Ed to go first, Ed, to go ahead, yeah. Ed, and then I'll follow Sure, up. I mean, we're a developer first, API first platform. So the, the product is oriented around uh, allowing developers who may not be superstars and being able to either leverage or choose or select their own large language models for appropriate use cases, um, but they, that want to be able to instantly add the power of large language models into their application set. We started with search because we think it's going to be one of the first places that people try to take advantage of large language models to help find information within an application context. And we've built our own large language models focused on making it very efficient and elegant to find information more quickly. So what a developer can do is within minutes, go up, register for an account, and get access to a set of APIs that allow them to send data to be converted into a format that's easy to understand for, for large language models, vectors. And then secondarily, they can issue queries, ask questions, and they can ask them very, they, the questions that can be asked are very natural language questions. So we're talking about long form sentences, um, rep, you know, drill down types of questions, and they can get answers that either come back in, depending upon the form factor of the user interface in list form or summarized form, uh, where summarized equals the opportunity to kind of see a condensed singular answer. All right, I have a, I have a. I, 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 Okay, go ahead, you go. I was just going to say, I could, I'm going to be a customer for you because I want, my dream was to have a hologram of the Cube host, me and Dave, mm -hmm. and have questions be generated in the metaverse. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. There'll be no longer any guests here. We'll, there'll all be a AIs talking to you guys. <laughs> Give me a couple of bullets, I'll spit out 10 good questions, yeah. publish a story. Right. <laughs> automation, I'm, I'm, this brings the automation. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 ahead, no, no. no, 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 no. I was just going to follow on, on the same. Uh, so another way to look at exactly what Ed described is, we want to offer you ChatGPT for your own data, right? So imagine taking all of the recordings of all of the interviews you have done and having all of the content of that being ingested by a system where you can now have a conversation with your own data and say, oh, last time when I met Amr, which video games did we talk about? Which uh, movie or book did we use as an analogy for how we should be embracing uh, data science and big, um, and big data, which is Moneyball. I know you use <laughs> Moneyball all the time. A yeah. And you start having that conversation. So, so now the data doesn't become a passive um, asset that you just have in your organization. No, it's an active participant that's sitting with you on the table, helping you make decisions. What, one of my favorite things to do with customers is to go to their site or application and show them me using it so for example, one of the customers I talked to was uh, one, of the, one of the biggest uh, property management companies in the world that you know, lets people go and rent homes and houses and things like that. And you know, I went and I showed them me searching through reviews, looking for information and trying different words and trying to find out like, you know, is this place quiet? Is it, is it comfortable? Um, and then I put all the same data into our platform and I showed them the world of difference you can have when you start asking that question wholeheartedly and getting real information that wouldn't, doesn't have anything to do with the words you ask, but is really focused on the meaning. Uh, you know, when I asked, like, is it quiet? Um, you know, things, answers would come back like the wind whispered through the trees peacefully, and you know, it's like nothing to do with quiet in the literal word sense, but in the in the meaning sense, everything to do with it. And that that was magical even for them to see that. Well, you guys are on the front wave, this on the front end of this big wave. Congratulations on the start of Amr. I know you guys got great pedigree in big data and you got a great team and congratulations. Vectara is the name of the company, check them out. Um, again, the startup boom is coming. This is a, one of the, will be one of the major waves. Generative AI mm -hmm. is here. It will be, I think, look back and be, will be pointed at as a major inflection point Absolutely. in the industry. Uh, there's not a lot of hype behind that. People are, are seeing it, experts are. So it's going to be fun. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Thanks, Joe.